Oh, hey, Bill. How's it going? Oh, hey, Frank. You know, just another day of endless pain trapped in this here wall. Is that Frank right here over there? Hey, Frank. How's it going? Oh, you know it's going. Hang on. I think someone's coming. Shh. What the hell is going on in here? Did you hear that? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week. This week we'll be taking a look at what is truly one of the most unsettling creatures I've come across in quite a while. Not since the Urna Curse has something so vile come across my desk, and today I'm going to be telling you all about the Living Wall. Yes, this week's monster is literally a wall, and yes, I think it is an incredible creature in a really fucked up sort of way. As always, my objective here today is to go over this monster's in-game lore, its publication history, as well as provide you with an updated 5th edition stat block and a few potential encounter and story ideas. So, what exactly is a living wall? Well, for starters, the name is a bit of a misnomer as the living wall is actually not alive, but a type of undead. Semantics thrown out the window, though essentially a living wall is a wall built entirely out of flesh and bones, which are all harvested from living creatures. It should also come as no surprise that the living wall got its start in the horror-centric setting of Ravenloft specifically in the Book of Crypts, which was a 1991 publication for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. This book included nine new adventures which were all set in Ravenloft. To accompany these adventures, four new monsters were included by the way of the Ermordenug. Ermordenug? What the, f what the fuck is that? <laughs> the doll and bone golems, and of course the living wall. The wall would later be updated into 3rd edition as part of Dragon Magazine issue 343 in May of 2006. Which to be honest kind of butchered the art and just the monster's entire concept, but that's just my opinion. Now to create a living wall, any number of creatures are fused together in a profane necromantic ritual that traps them in a horrible new form. Once trapped in this new grotesque form, the living wall reaches out using limbs of those fused into it to attack with claws and swords and spells and ultimately drag other creatures into the wall. Being fused into the wall, of course, kills the creatures used to create it, but as Star Wars has taught us time and time again, no one's ever really gone. The creatures grafted into the wall are thus reborn into undead versions of themselves, which are also fused into the wall. And this is where things get a little bit confusing, but stick with me. The living wall itself is one singular creature, at least for statistical purposes. It has one stat block and it gets one turn in the initiative order, but it is made up of multiple creatures. Try to think of each victim who has been trapped in the living wall the same way you might think of individual bricks that make up a normal, not horrible wall. Anyone who is absorbed into the wall loses a lot of themselves in the process and typically goes quite mad. But there are still little remnants of the original creature trapped inside that are desperate for escape. See, when a creature is forced to become part of a living wall, that creature's soul becomes trapped as well. This of course prevents them from moving on to the afterlife. Much like signing on to an MLM, the only way out is to achieve true death. Which of course means that every individual trapped within the wall would likely love to see the wall's destruction but it's not quite so simple. The magic which created the wall itself twists its victims and forces them to lash out at any potential threat. The wall is not simply compelled to just attack every John, Jerry, and Jane that comes within striking distance, however. Only when someone actually hits the wall or does something which could be considered a threat is the wall compelled to actually defend itself. So basically, if you end up fighting a living wall, you are battling a swarm of appendages while also trying to ignore all the cries and pleas for help from the victims trapped within. But of course, there is ever more body horror on the horizon today. Because if someone dies while within 300 feet of the wall, 
the wall is able to raise that creature as a zombie and compel them to walk over to it, at which point they become incorporated into its form. If this is all starting to sound pretty horrific to you, that's because it is. As the wall absorbs more and more bodies, the cacophony of trapped creatures desperate for release from this fleshy prison grows, and so too does the wall itself. What might start as a pretty small structure can grow to tremendous size as it absorbs more and more creatures. But as the wall sucks in more victims, its size is not the only thing that changes. The wall gains access to any equipment, racial traits, attacks, or spells the new member of its body possessed at the time of their absorption. For example, a fighter wielding a greatsword will give the wall a greatsword attack. A wizard who had fireball and cone of cold prepared will give the wall the ability to cast each of of those spells once per day. A fire genasi who gets absorbed will give the wall fire resistance and access to the produce flame and burning hand spells. What this means is that every living wall can be vastly different depending on what creatures are used in its original creation and what creatures it has absorbed since it was born. As you can probably imagine, that made it very difficult to create a 5th edition stat block for this monster, but more on that later. Something we also need to talk about is the living walls built in illusion magic. See, at first, the wall itself, at a glance, doesn't appear to be anything more than your standard stone or brick wall. This illusion cast on the creature doesn't do anything about the screams of the damned, which are literally emanating from the thing at all times, but it does create a bit of a mystery. I think the original flavor text for the creature says it best. This stone wall appears normal, but moans of pain, horror, and sorrow emanate from it. Although the wall is still, there is a sense of chaotic motion within it. This illusion adds a real element of intrigue to the creature that I think is pretty understated. Despite the fact that we're talking about a literal wall, which literally has a movement speed of zero, I think there are a ton of ways we can use this monster, some of which are a little outside of its conventional purpose. So if you'll continue on this journey with me, the next thing we're gonna talk about is its actual in-game statistics and how they work as well as how I interpreted them into 5th edition D&D. And then we're going to talk about plot hooks and story ideas. Also, if you find these videos useful or just entertaining, please leave a like or a comment. It helps the channel out a ton. And I also just like hearing what you guys have to say about the monsters that we cover. Now, I hope you have a gem of seeing because it is time for... So there is actually a surprising amount of stuff to talk about when it comes to the living wall and its stats. The original living wall from AD&D was sort of a template that you would apply to as many creatures as were incorporated into the wall itself. 5th edition D&D really stays away from templates when compared with other versions of the game at least. We definitely still have a few like the Half Dragon or the Draco Lich, but overall templates are way less prominent than they once were, and in my opinion, a little bit hard to use. I mean, maybe they're not hard to use and I'm just lazy, but... I don't like doing a ton of prep work for my prep work. For my conversion of this monster, I wanted to give you guys something that is easy to look at and easy to use, and that falls in line with D&D 5th Edition's design philosophy. So the stat block that I came up with is basically a simplified version of the wall that can cast a couple spells, use a great sword attack, and chuck javelins. Because the biggest thing we actually need the stat block for isn't its attacks, but how its ability to absorb other creatures works mechanically. And I think you'll find that my version is nearly a one-to-one -one conversion of the old-school Ravenloft stat block. Basically, in addition to the other simple attacks there, I gave it an attack that allows it to do a small amount of damage as well as grapple the target called Grasping Hands. I wanted our living wall to still have that ability to forcibly pull people into its form, but we also don't want it to be a simple case of, oops, you failed the saving throw and now you're dead. So this attack works in tandem with the wall's absorption trait, which states that at the beginning of the wall's turn, if it is grappling someone, that creature becomes restrained. And 
think then if we go through another full round of combat, at the start of the wall's next turn, if it has someone restrained, that creature is then pulled into the wall, which kills them and incorporates that creature into its form. This is still really deadly, and that means the wall can still suck people in, but there are a few stop gaps in place so that it isn't completely unfair to the players. I mean, come on, you don't want to miss out on that dramatic moment of them trying to pull their friend out who's being gradually sucked into this wall, right? Oh my god! Other than that, the stats are basically there to just explain in game terms how the absorption of another creature actually benefits the wall, how it grows, and how its new acquired abilities work. Something else I want to briefly touch on too is that in 5th edition, we don't really have rules for how long creatures work. The wall, for example, is a huge sized creature, but it doesn't necessarily occupy a 15 by 15 foot square space. I mean, it's a wall, so it's not going to be built in a square, it's going to be like 15 feet long, but maybe only three feet thick or something like that. This is just something to keep in mind because there aren't really specific rules in 5th edition, at least not that I'm aware of, to codify something like that. But I mean, you guys know what a wall looks like, so I'm assuming no one was going to look at that and be like, oh, why is it a big square? <laughs> Anyways, just something to keep in mind. When it comes to actually fighting this thing, the living wall in almost every case is going to serve as an obstacle for the adventuring party to overcome. Once again, it literally is a wall, which means that the party can leave anytime they want. It's not going to chase them, it's not going to hunt them down, it's going to be just there doing its thing. If they choose to simply fight it in toe-to-toe -to -toe combat, that's pretty risky, but they are definitely welcome to do so. The basic version of the wall, assuming you haven't added any other actions or abilities to it, is going to be able to fight in melee and from a range. But I also really want to make it clear that you can make this encounter a lot harder or a lot easier for your group depending on what your needs are. You can give it access to any weapon or spell that may have belonged to a creature it absorbed, so get creative with it. As an example, I personally love the idea of giving the wall the telekinesis spell so that it can pull people towards it and then grab them. But maybe that's a little mean. It's perfect. Something else to keep in mind is that the wall can and will absorb any useful equipment being worn by those who it sucks in. So if some unfortunate soul wearing a ring of fire resistance was absorbed, the wall just now has fire resistance. But also keep in mind the more cool magic items you give your wall, the deadlier it's going to be, and the more treasure your players will get when they ultimately destroy it if they can manage to topple the thing. Neither of which are necessarily bad things, just something to think about. Now, I'm sure by this point you get it, you understand the concept, but there is still one very important thing we need to talk about, which is just exactly how to effectively use the living wall in a story. This thing can be a pretty compelling part of any tale, and I have a few ideas for how we might actually use it. So, let's move on and chat about a few. So immediately, I think it goes without saying, that the wall is a potent tool a necromancer is liable to use to block off part of their lair. That was definitely the purpose behind its creation, and in fact the adventure the living wall was originally used in describes exactly this scenario. The adventure is literally called the Living Crypt. In this adventure, the party goes out in search of some missing townsfolk, tracking them down to a mysterious cave that seems to be walled off a few feet in. At the base of the wall are a bunch of clothes, coins, pieces of armor, and other mundane items. The wall here, of course, is a living wall, and all that stuff on the floor is stuff that the absorbed victims had on them, which the wall didn't deem useful enough to actually incorporate. Something actually really interesting here is that in this scenario, the wall has a few bite attacks as it has absorbed a few wolves who pass into the cave as well. So definitely don't just limit yourself to humanoid creatures. In any case, the local necromancer and his minions have been kidnapping people and feeding them to the wall to strengthen their fortress. Only by destroying the wall can anyone actually get past the main entrance. There is a lot you can do here as an enterprising necromancer, because even though most people won't be able to see the wall's true nature, the fact the fact that it's going to be constantly wailing in agony is likely to turn any travelers away. Even your most curious townsfolk are not going to want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. Most people are likely to just think the area is haunted, which it is, just 
Not in the way that they think it is. In fact, that could make for a pretty good story as well. The group of adventurers might be tasked with investigating a nearby haunted ruin, only to find out that there is a living wall blocking the way. Once they manage to take it down and get past, they may stumble upon a necromancer's lair and unwrap some horrible scheme that is much larger than they originally thought. What started as a simple ghost hunt may very well end in the player saving an entire town from being turned turned into ghouls. But let's take things in a slightly different direction for a moment. Perhaps your necromancer isn't one for subtlety. Maybe they are much, much more accomplished, achieving some sort of dark lord status. This necromancer has a castle, a black iron fortress, which is guarded by an army of the undead. I'm talking about some high level epic tier Lord of the Rings kind of shit. Now imagine if this necropolis of evil is not surrounded by a standard spiky wall of metal, but a living wall of flesh. I mean something tremendous in size that wraps around for miles. A living wall crafted from thousands of creatures who dared to defy the necromancer's ambitions. Now sure, most people who formerly lived in the land were doomed to become zombies in the necromancer's army, but those who really pissed him off ended up as part of the wall, damned to eternal torment and forced to oversee the lands they once ruled, now corrupted by evil. In this case, the necromancer probably wouldn't even bother with the illusion of stone, but just rather let the world see and look upon what happens to those who defy the Dark Lord. If you were gonna go for something this large in scale, it would definitely make no sense for the Living Wall to have one singular hit point pool. In this case, I would recommend making every 30 foot section of the wall its own stat block, but of course for narrative purposes it's all just one giant thing. Even if the players don't end up fighting the wall, it would still make for an excellent set piece, and if they do choose to engage with it, you've got the mechanics to back it up. I imagine the screams and moans of horror would echo for miles as the players approach. And once they actually see the source of all the noise, it's likely gonna be pretty impactful. You could even have the necromancer's entire lair be built out of living walls if you really wanted to. Maybe the party has to find a specific NPC buried in the wall somewhere and ask them a question or get some piece of really important information from them. Perhaps the former king of the land is entombed deep within the necromancer's lair, melded into a wall of flesh, kept in a specific spot so the necromancer can come by and torment him from time to time. And the players have to get there and learn the secret location of some MacGuffin that might be able to stop the necromancer. Who knows, but anytime there is a quasi-sentient meat wall involved, it's gonna be memorable. One final detail I really need to note here because I think it's really incredible is the living Wall's hatred, specifically for the one who created it. While the Living Wall might be bound to the necromancer that crafted it in the first place, every creature inside that wall wants nothing more than to destroy the bastard. So, if the creator of the Living Wall ever dies close enough to it that the wall can absorb them, it will 100% do so. And immediately after the necromancer is absorbed, according to the Ravenloft book, the wall will then expel all other corpses and spirits trapped inside of it, finally allowing them to die and rest in peace. The wall's creator, however, is now permanently trapped within a wall of their own creation, forever sealed in the stone, never to be heard from again. The wall then loses all of its necromantic powers and they are simply stuck there forever. And if that's not justice, then I don't know what is. In the grand necromancer campaign idea I was talking about before, I imagine it would be a very fitting end to have the villain slain, leaving the party to watch as the massive flesh walls tumble all around them. The tortured souls finally set free. 
In terms of less epic and over-the-top applications, including a living wall as just part of a dungeon, or as a simple wall in the basement of some cultists, can also be really effective. Something else mentioned in the Ravenloft book is that there is precedent for a wall coming about naturally, sort of. By naturally, all I really mean is without the intervention of a magic user. The specific instance it describes in the book is that if someone is sealed away in a wall or tomb of some kind while they are still alive, the sheer anger, fear, and dismay attached to their death might cause them to actually become a living wall. In this kind of scenario, the party might end up fighting a living wall only to realize that it came about as the result of a murder and the murderer hid the body in some building perhaps. Or maybe they just straight up killed them by sealing them inside. I could see a murder mystery playing out around a newly constructed building with a haunted basement where someone killed a rival and thought they hid the body expertly. To be fair, the inside of a wall is a pretty good hiding place. Regardless of the setup though, it's likely any good characters will likely want to tear down this wall. And whether it's a simple task or a tricky one, the end result is bound to be impactful. If you like this monster and you think you might want to use it, but you're not playing AD&D or 3.5, as always, there is an updated 5th edition stat block in the description below. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, you will of course find the 5th edition monster manual style stat block over on the Patreon page, which is also linked down below. If you're not a patron, please consider checking it out because I'm trying to make YouTube my full-time gig and it is pretty intense. So I appreciate the support tremendously. And speaking of patrons, it's time for Patron of the Week. This week's randomly selected patron is Claire McQuillan. Thank you so much for the support, Claire. It's very McChillin of you to be here. And thank you for watching. If you have a monster you'd like to see show up on Monster of the Week, let me know in the comments, on Twitter, over on Discord, or by Carrier Pigeon. Whatever you might use to contact me, let me know. I will add it to the list. I will check it out, and you just might see it show up on the channel. But that's all for today. Until the next one. Balls and butts. Butts and balls and balls and butts.